All right, so uh, first of all, I'd like to start by thanking Juan and Gabrielle for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, people have said that it feels like a family reunion. And uh, you should know one thing. And the thing is that my wife, Chiara, has a soft spot for Stefan. And uh, she refers to him as tuo fratello maggiore, which means basically your big brother. And I think it comes back to the days where I studied under Yves Meyer as an undergrad. And I remember learning about Stefan's work back then and being extraordinarily impressed <laughs> with what we were learning. And um, in fact, more than that, I not far from here, very close from here, actually, I did an internship as an undergrad on image analysis. And I remember spending weeks reading his papers and trying to translate them into code that would detect various things in images. And so it was really uh, something spectacular. So Stefan, I always thought of you as a trailblazer, as an out of, you know, someone who thinks out of the box. And I think what I've tried to do in my life is to emulate you. Uh, first by going to the Ecole Polytechnique, <laughs> then by doing uh, my PhD abroad in the United States, and more generally to try to follow your philosophy and your approach to, to science. And I don't know that I've succeeded. I've done my best, but I don't know Pretty that well. I've succeeded. Well. <laughs> one, thing, one thing I have not managed to do is to dance as well as you do. And so I hope we'll see a glimpse of that tonight. Um, <laughs> and, um, and that's what I wanted to say. Um, so um, one thing you said, though, to me, uh, and I remember it very well because I think it had a profound influence on me, is that you said something like, I remember being sort of in love with information theory at some point. It's so clean and so elegant. And you said something like, what makes a field interesting is in when it's messy. And it has it's stayed with me. All right. And so I just want to thank you for that. And I left harmonic analysis a while ago. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about deep learning, but not about deep learning per se, about what we should build around deep learning. And so, and so this is what I'm going to talk about today. So this is a very different talk from what you've heard, and I apologize for that. So this is a map of the 2020 uh, presidential election results by county. And so when you see uh, there are about 3,100 counties in the United States, and when you see a dark blue color, it means that Joe Biden really improved on Hillary from 2016 to 2020. So dark blue but gained about 50%. And a dark red color means that Trump did better than in the previous election. And so what you can see that this map is basically blue, which means that Joe Biden did well. And, and that's what we all know. And so if you were working for a news organization like the Washington Post, for instance, and a lot of things that you're going to hear about today is actually used in production by the Washington Post, is you would like to tell your readership about the outcome of the election when all the votes would have been tallied. But this is an area, and I think a lot of people are talking about prediction, where the cost of being wrong is exceptionally high. Like if you call a state the wrong way, it has an enormous cost. And so John Sherian and Lenny Bronner here, uh, John Sherian is a graduate student of mine, and Lenny Bronner, a data scientist at the Washington Post, have used some of the ideas you hear about today to try to explain and tell their readership what you might expect once all the votes will have been counted reflecting uncertainty. Again, we're talking about application where the cost of being wrong is very high. And so um, what they were saying and giving their readership is a view of where they think the election is going to end up. And so uh, because they use some of our tools, um, you know, I took a snapshot of the website of some of the Washington Post on November 5, 2020 at 12.50 a.m. So the election was the day before. And so all eyes were on the state of Pennsylvania, and they were all trying to explain a bit graphically where, project uncertainty about where they think they're going to go. And so you see sort of a histogram or like a probability distribution for Biden, a probability <coughs> distribution. You see that the one for Biden is a bit shifted on the right. And the thing we're going to discuss is how do you get these projections in such a way that they're well calibrated, that they really reflect a true understanding of what's going on. OK, so I don't think I need to tell you that now we need machine learning uh, to drive extremely important applications. Um, you know, I, I don't need to convince this audience. We use machine learning everywhere. 
uh, for medical diagnosis to see it actually. So we use machine learning in the United States to decide whether people are going to get parole or not. And so the question is, can we have confidence in these predictions? And, um, you know, as a, as a statistician, you know, um, it's very important when I issue a prediction, how certain, I'm going to ask basic questions, and I'm not saying I have the answers to all of them, but we're going to try to develop answers. How certain am I of my prediction, you know? Do I really need to give you a point prediction? Wouldn't it be better to give you a sense of uncertainty? I mean, uh, we're in the Jim Simons Auditorium. I say, Jim, I predict that the return of this portfolio is going to be 5%. I think you would want to know a little bit, yeah, but what, what um, error bar do you put around this? Can my model be safely displayed? I think as we use these very complex machines, and people, I, I, I envy some of you are brave enough to actually open the black box and try to understand what's behind. We're not going to do that. We're going to build around the black box. We're not going to open it. I want to use a black box, but I want to build an ecosystem around it such that, you know, I, what the black box produces, I can trust, I can inform decisions, and, uh, and I can convey uncertainty to people who have to implement policy, make decisions, and so on. So one solution to work around the black box and convey uncertainty is something that's very simple. And you might doubt that it's actually possible, but as we'll see, it's possible, obviously, is this. So I'm going to give you data, training data, and a test point. You know, this is a classical machine learning setup where you have data which is exchangeable in general, but if we don't know what exchangeability means, it's the EHRS. I felt I had to use a chalk, otherwise they're going to kick us out, I think. So I have a definition of exchangeability. It means that well, we're going to come back to the definition of exchangeability later. So what it means is like you can think about a very special case of exchangeability is the data is IID. And so I have a test point XN plus one. I just see the covariate, but I don't see the response. I need to predict the response. And what we're going to be focused in this talk is something extremely simple where, I mean, at least we can describe it simply, is I want to construct not a point estimate, but a range which we're going to call C of X, that contains a true label a given fraction of the time, let's say 90% of the time. And so the thing that is a bit surprising the first time you hear about this is I want to be able to do this. So I want to return a list of labels that contain the true label 90% of the time. The label can be quantitative, it can be an object, a category. And I want this to hold no matter what the distribution is, which I'm not assuming no matter the sample size, and perhaps no matter the black box you use. Okay? So I want to be able to say, going back to my election example, that based on the covariates and what we've seen from the election so far, you know, the vote change from 2016 to 2020, uh, in, for this county is going to be in the range 3.17 to 7.6%, but when I make this prediction, I need to be correct 90% of the time, or 95, whatever you choose. So, and I guess it's a, it's a fancy slide, but it's really the thing I want to convey, which is that I'm not going to try to develop a mathematical theory of deep learning. Not at all. I want to use deep learning, but I'm going to build around it. And so the way you think about this is you have your predictive layers. This I'm not going to touch. Or I could touch it a bit, but in a very more unessential way. What I want to do is then is I want to build a predictive layer that will take the outcome and return a list of items, and I'm pretty sure that the true item is one of them. And I want, again, to hold this to hold, no matter the distribution of the data, no matter the predictive layer. What's in front of the car, I want to know, and you need to be correct a certain fraction of the time. So what we could do is we could try to perhaps learn from the errors of the model. So we have training data, we can see the size of typical errors, but I think I don't need to convince this audience that this is useless. This is useless because if you work in deep learning, usually you train a network to zero error. And so you would be a fool to think that the error you observe on the training set is reflective of the errors you're going to observe in the future. So that's not working at all. So we're going to have to develop um, other notions. And so this is where conformal prediction will enter. Conformal prediction comes in very different flavors, um, but this is uh, largely a field that was developed by Vladimir Vov, whom I met a few years ago. He's a wonderful researcher in London. Uh, Glenn Schaefer, to some extent, uh, people who have influenced my thinking an enormous amount. And so, um, so I just want to thank them for that. 
So I'm going to show you a method that would just return absolutely correct prediction intervals no matter this data distribution. And so, <clears throat> so we're going to discuss full conformal because this is a very smart audience. So I think you, you, you can take uh, a sophisticated view on this. So, so we have a data set and my boss is coming and says, Emmanuel, you need to reissue. Now I observe a new value, Xn plus one, it's 4.7. So this is a blue tick we see here, and you, see, you need to issue a prediction range for the y and t plus one that I have not seen. So how is this going to work? Well, um, we're going to postulate, we're going to say, could it be little y? So I'm going to put a dot little y, and I'm going to say, could it be little y? Could little y be in my prediction set? And so what we're going to do is we're going to fit a model, and this is where you can fit your neural net architecture with xn plus 1 and y, get residual, and count, well, when I look at the residual for little y, the imputed value, is it atypical or not? And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to fit a model. We're going to compute residuals. And then we're going to say, aha. This residual is not atypical. In fact, it's in the top 27% in magnitude of all the residual you've seen. It seems to conform to things. And now we're going to move this little y again. And then we get each time we redo the same operation. Now, if you look at my animation carefully, when I move little y up, the black curve will move up because it's going to pull the white curve. It's going to pull the model, actually. So you move the black curve. And now it becomes a less typical residual. As you can see, the residual starts to increase. The magnitude starts to increase. You pull it up, you pull it up. Now it becomes very unusual. And now you've reached the point where it is the largest residual. And so now the picture doesn't move anymore. And so at the end of the, of the day, you have, you're going to return a prediction interval that corresponds to all tested values of y, such that you're in the bottom 90% in magnitude, that you sort of like usual residuals. Right, so y is in the prediction interval if it's in the bottom 90%, or if it's not in the top 10%. Okay, now you'd say, ah, Emmanuel, there's a problem with this. And the problem is, of course, each time you have to refeed a model. And of course, people have worked around these things. But, um, but why does this work, in a nutshell? So, what you have is you have a training data. You can think about the training data as IID if you'd like. It, in general, it has to be exchangeable. And you're going to fit a model mu hat. That's your neural net. You know, Can I interpolate? Can I do whatever you want? So you have a mu hat. All I'm going to ask from your algorithm is that it treats the data point symmetrically. That is, the order in which I give you the data doesn't matter, which is most true of most. The order in which I give you images doesn't matter. And so then you get a model mu hat. Then we're computing these residuals, ri. And then there's an unknown residual, yn plus 1 minus, minus mu hat x, that we have not seen because we don't know yn plus 1. But what we know is that these residuals are exchangeable. And exchangeable, it means here, is that when I look at, if I were to give you the bag of residuals, if I would say, these are the model errors, which one is a test point? You could not tell. Instead, it says it's equally likely to be this one, this one, this one, by virtue of the algorithm we use. So because it's equally likely to be any one of them when I give you the bag of residuals, well, it's going to be in the bottom 90%, 90% of the time. All right. But of course, I do not know yn plus 1, because this argument only works if I see yn plus 1. And so what is the, the model? The, 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 the model is you're going to propose the test value. You're going to fit a model assuming that your test value is y. And if <coughs> your computed residual, and of course the residual depends on these test values. The model you fit depends on the test value. If you're in the bottom 90%, you're going to include it. If you're not, you're not going to include it. And then there's this beautiful result that says, well, this is a valid prediction interval. That is, you, the chance that y in plus 1 for which the answer is yes, it's exactly 90%. It's not about 90%, it's exactly 90%. And so you've, you know, that's kind of remarkable because you have correctness and you haven't made no modeling assumption, you can use anything you like. So that's, that's pretty good. 
Now you'd say, well, I cannot run this because I have to refit the model each time, and I agree. And so people have developed version where you split the data, you have to read to fit the model only once, but then you lose efficiency because you used a lot of data to calibrate and not enough to fit. And so there's this method we developed with Rina Barber, Aditya Ramdas, and Orion Tiprani, which we call the Jackknife Plus, which I think is my method of choice for, for constructing prediction interval with, with complicated models. Okay. So, um, one thing that I, you, you, from my little animation earlier, you might think, okay, it's a bit strange to actually, if you want to kind of fit a prediction interval, you're essentially interested in the conditional quantiles of the label given x. So you would like to learn the conditional distribution. Why do you start by estimating the mean function? And I agree, that's kind of my, uh, an issue with, I think, some of the work in conformal inference. It's, it's a good idea, but perhaps it does not use the right algorithm. Instead, what I should perhaps do when I have data that exhibits like heteroscedasticity, we can see that the variance of y given x changes depending on where you are in x space. I might want to use something which is more flexible. So I might want to fit quantiles instead. So of course we can use neural nets to fit quantiles, which has changed the loss function to, to what's called the pinball loss. And we can fit quantiles. Are, are they going to be well calibrated? No, so we're going to calibrate them using essentially the same ideas as you've seen before. And so, um, so what we've, we've done is we've actually uh, designed a function or, uh, or ideas around conformal that would actually fit prediction interval that adapts to the geometry of the data by fitting quantiles and then calibrating them properly or doing both at the same time. Okay, and so one benefit is that you're going to get better conditional coverage if you know what I'm talking about or also, because you're more adaptive, you're going to tend to find intervals that have better lengths. So it's more effective. All right, and so the way you would do this, and I'm sorry, I'm going to skip. And so I'm just surveying a very broad field. Like you should know that last year on conformal prediction, I don't know how many people are familiar with this field. I would estimate that there were about two, 3,000 papers published on this subject last year alone. And if you go to New Europe, that is a lot of discussion is on conformal prediction. Okay, so, so you've got, you fit your quantiles, and then you're going to calibrate them, and so you're going to use a score function to calibrate them. All right, because what you can do with conformal prediction, you don't have to look at residuals. The argument works far more broadly, and so now it becomes a question of how do you should, what should you fit and how should you calibrate? And so what you can do is you pick any conformity score you like, so uh, before I emphasize the error, the, the model error, but it doesn't have to be this. So um, you're going to apply a symmetric algorithm. So that is, you need to treat the point symmetrically. The order cannot matter. Otherwise, you're going to lose exchangeability. Otherwise, you might tell which one is a test point. And then you're going to pick uh, the quantile of your conformity scores, and you're going to include a point y in the prediction if the conformity score you see is typical, that is, it's in the bottom 90%. And you can use this, and the exact same argument applies, and you're going to be correct 90% of the time. So you have a machine that turns a predictive engine into an uncertainty quantification, if you'd like, engine. Okay, so this can... This works extremely well, so here's just an example. Uh, you're trying to predict the use of medical services as measured by the number of visits to a hospital or doctors, and you have lots of covariates, including your age, your marital status, your race, your poverty status, your health insurance type, and so on. And so you have lots of features, lots of subjects, the kind of stuff that you all know about, and then well, you know, this is kind of, this is, these box plots are so boring because you want 90%, you get exactly 90%. You don't get 93 or 87 or 85, you get 90%. That's kind of a theorem. All right. And so all we need to discuss now, now that we have a baseline, like now we're prescriptive, we know what we can get. Now what we need to talk about is, well, you know, what else do you want? <laughs> and so maybe I want short lengths. Or maybe I want to get a better con conditional coverage. And so what these plots are showing you, well, if you use a CQR versus what people were using before, like this idea of conformalism quantum, which was done with by Yaniv Romano, by the way. Um, so 
uh, you get better lengths and better conditional properties and so on. So now you know you can. That's why you use your creativity to define, uh, design good conformity scores that adapt are well suited for the problem at hand. Okay, you can also do. Uh, this is again John with Yaniv and another student, Matteo. You can actually tell me what's in a picture. So it doesn't have to be a continuous uh, label. It can be a discrete label. And so uh, here the conformalizer would say, well, it's a fox squirrel. Here it's less sure. It says if you want to be 90% correct, I don't know whether it's a fox squirrel, a gray fox, a bucket, or rain barrel, because it's a harder image. And so the length of the predictive set, the cardinality of the predict set increases, and it's going to be increased even more here. Like the, and it really reflects what you know. And what I like about this, when you implement this, is when you have a large prediction set, you're honest about what you know, and also about what you don't know. <laughs> and, so, and so this is, um, I mean, people are using this left and right at the moment. Okay. So I had this movie. This is, was just to impress you, but I don't think I need to impress you anyway. So it's, it can go in a computer vision pipeline and you can label things. And each time you know that 90% of your labeling is correct and, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, and this is what's joined with a group uh, between my group and the work of Michael Jordan at UC Berkeley. Okay. So now you have a lot of possibilities. You know, we know how to get exactly the accuracy you want. And now you can say, well, which model do I want to use? Do I want to use something simple like logistic? Do I want to something complicated like neural nets? Do I want to use full conformal, split conformal, or this new method, the Jackknife Plus? You know, the coverage is always 90%. That's kind of what we see. And then you can, look, for example, we can look at the set size. And if we were to look at the set size as a, a good criterion on different data sets, things that you know about, the NIST data set, the fashion NIST data set, we would recognize that maybe using a kernel SVM with the Jackknife Plus is a good idea. Okay. All right. So as I said, it is used to predict the election by, by the Washington Post at least. So let's see how it does. And um, so I, this is a little a mock-up experiment. So I think people not familiar with the US election, five minutes, okay. People not familiar with the U.S. election, um, you know, some, at any point in time, you see uh, counties have reported and you'd like to predict the outstanding counties. And so here in this mock-up experiment, I have a, a training set of about 1,200 counties that have reported. I need to predict 1,900 of them. And, you know, it's exactly what you want. It doesn't matter which algorithm you want, you're going to be correct. Exactly the fraction of time you want. So, which is quite remarkable. But people who know a little bit more about the elections would know that I may not be exchangeable. And the reason I'm not exchangeable is that during election night in the United States, you know, counties that are on the eastern side tend to report earlier, counties that are a bit less populous report earlier, rural counties report earlier. And so what you hold at any given time may not be representative of what you have left to predict. And in fact, this is what I'm going to show you. If I were to actually use the counties in the eastern time zone of the United States to predict the outstanding county, all the others, the accuracy is not that good. And it's because you have a covariate shift. The, the counties are not representative of what you're about to see. There's something special about them. The methods are not doing as they should be doing. Like CQR is a bit better, but you're not reaching the 90% you want. So you, the accuracy you want is not there. And do I still have five minutes? So, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so the last five minutes I wanted to talk to you about, I think what is the other thing that is all the rage at NeurIPS when people don't talk about deep learning, it's about distributional shifts. And so there's a lot of activity in this. I'm gonna show you a little idea. It's really a baby idea, but that seems to work quite well. And so this is joint work with Isaac Gibbs, another student from Stanford. And here's uh, a wonderful Isaac, um, another extraordinary person. So why does conformal inference work? It works because I observe what I have seen so far and I get a histogram. And that's the purple histogram. 
there's a distribution of conformity scores I'm about to observe, and it's the same. It's, a, it's because it's exchangeable, so it's the same distribution. Now, when people talk about covariate shifts, and I don't know how people can even do that, in covariate shifts, when you talk to people, they say, oh, I'm going to model this by being in a KL ball in small distance. Look, guys, we're in a million dimensions. Like, so I don't know how you think about this stuff. So I don't want to think about this stuff. I say, all right, so is this going to be a shift? And so my quantile, which was right here, which was working fine so far, should I move it up a bit to the right or should I move it up to the left? That is, is the distribution going to shift to the right? Or is it going to be shift? So instead of learning a full high dimensional shift, I'm just going to try to say, Emmanuel, you had this thing, like you want to use a quantile of some empirical distribution you've seen. Maybe you don't want to use a 90th percentile because maybe errors have gotten a bit bigger recently. The stock market is more volatile. And so you want to use a 95th percentile. Or maybe things are calmer than you used to be. Maybe you want to use an 85th percentile. And so, Okay, this is the simplest equation. So the idea is to say, what I can observe is I can observe the empirical distribution of the conformity scores that I've seen so far. But what I need to do is I need to guess what is the quantile of the distribution I'm not seeing. And so I want to know, should I move my quantile to the left, to the right, so that I track the right quantile of the probability distribution. So the key idea is to learn, can we actually le learn alpha star t which is a quantile of the distribution, which could actually correspond to the 90th percentile of the true distribution. And so we're going to do this by learning. And so this is, I submit, the simpler equa simplest equation ever produced at EHS, <laughs> which is alpha t plus 1 is going to be alpha t plus gamma. T. So alpha is your level error, it's 0.1. And so you're going to say, this is the error. So you observe whether you just made an error or not. This is a form of a control procedure, if you think about it. It's like in a control procedure. It's like, I think of this, there's a power plant, and I have a knob, and I'm going to turn it so that I can get back the thing under control. And so what it means is if I just make a mistake, 1 minus alpha t will increase. Next time, I'm going to go move the quantile a bit to the right. If I just got it right, move it to a bit to the left. So track the thing like this. Now, it has, it's a form of online gradient descent. You say, what is gamma? All right, you can play all the bandit problems you want. There's fantastic ways of choosing gamma. I'm not going to discuss this. I just want to show you pictures. And maybe this is, again, a picture of the election. And again, I've ordered the counties from west to east, east to west. And what you're looking at here is you're looking at the target, which is 90%. And what you're looking at is you're looking at the average of your predictions, of the correctness of your prediction over 300 consecutive counties. And if you don't do any quantile adjustment, you get the red thing. And the red thing is you're entering the Midwest and what you've seen, you discover that what you've seen is not working. Like the Midwest is different from Manhattan. <laughs> and so it's different. And so the thing doesn't perform as well. But if you track the quantile, you get the blue curve. And the blue curve seems to be doing, it's hugging the 90% line, which is what you want. And you say, but is it good enough? And say, well, so it's hard to say whether it's good enough. So what I've done is I've plotted something which I consider to be the gold standard. And the gold standard is I'm going to flip coin with probability 0.9. This is IID 0.9. And then I'm going to make an average. So that you see the fluctuation if I were an ideal. If I knew, if I knew the correct quantiles, I would get the average of IID of bias coins. <laughs> and that is what you see in black. OK, and I know I should not speak like this, but it seems to me that the fluctuation of the black curve and the blue curves are not that different. So the errors that you do in the ideal case and involve this method are on the same magnitude. You get the behavior that you would get if I were actually handing to you the correct quantile. You've seen x, I've seen the quantile, and that's it. OK, now you can predict the stock market. The stock market, I'm not saying I can predict the stock market and say I can give uncertainty quantification about what I'm expected to see. Of course, we went through 2008, things go terribly bad. But if you apply this method, you, um, you get accurate predictions of 
of, I don't know, the volatility in the stock market and so on. You can calibrate the, what's called the value at risk of portfolios through enormous change in the economic conditions and so on. And this seems to do a, a good job in practice. Something strange about this thing is that, you see, this is a simple equation. And now there's no assumption. Not even as things are exchangeable, no assumption. And so what you can show is that over time, your error rate will be exactly what you want. And there's no assumption. It's a deterministic result. So what this is, is over the long run, you'll get the, the coverage, you, exactly the coverage you want. OK, I have more about uh, predicting COVID-19 cases and all that. And here you see San Francisco and Miami. I live in San Francisco. I visit Miami. I can tell you these are very different communities. And they behave very differently. And uh, yet the, the tracker, you know, it's just like the blue curve is always tracking. So this is trying to predict from stuff you can find on the internet about the number of cases the next week. Okay. And so it seems like it's extremely well calibrated. And maybe I'm going to skip this because I'm out of time. Um, so uh, I think I'm in love with this field. Um, I think it provides a form of honesty about what we've learned from data. Um, and also a form of risk management. It tells you how much you don't know. And so I think it's important. Uh, there's an explosion of interest in academia. There are thousands of papers published on this a year in industry. And that's very surprising for me to see. So I was in preparing for this lecture, I was actually looking at conformal prediction and I found this website, you know, AWS actually has products and other companies have products that implement all of this and a lot of things you've seen because they think that to be able to reliably tell what your complicated predictive model is telling you is extremely important. And with this, I conclude, Stefan, you've been an example for me. And so that's it. Yes, we are out of schedule, but we have time for questions. Thanks for a nice talk. So I have a, uh, maybe just a question, something maybe I didn't understand. For the conformal, like the, the second part of the talk, mm -hmm. when you when you have like some observed uh, covariate like x, mm -hmm. you wanna you wanna you know have intervals that are correct, conditional on x. Yes. The distribution shift, like the distribution that you're stu that you're studying is a. The, con the scores still depend on x. Right. So so this like the idea where you need to move it to the left or to the right. Right. That's more like a function of x, right? So so. Yes. Is it is it something that then like the, the regularity of this function with respect to x? That's totally right. So for example, if you have uh, if you have sudden change, like you have huge change point, all of a sudden you had seen x's over here and all of a sudden they're over here, then of course you're going to lose coverage for a while until you know, you've seen enough of what's going on over here, so you're going to recover it. So of course, you know, if something you start seeing values of covariate that you've never seen before, I'm not claiming anything. Yes. For complicated type of labels, would it make sense to learn the score function? Because I guess things depend a lot on the choice. Well, Gabriel is <laughs> always on top of things. That's what we're doing with uh, Isaac again, uh, which is, can you actually learn the score function? Like if I, so it's a bit, a bit differently. It's like the way, well, the way we think about this is a bit different. It says you come up, or I come up because I'm not as good as you. I come up with a conformity score, and you say, Emmanuel, your conformity score is no good. How can I actually find a second protection layer that will make it better? So maybe I control, I, maybe I, I get the marginal coverage you want, but maybe conditionally I'm less good. So you're worried about that, but for example, and this is something I've not discussed here, but we've done a lot of work trying to apply this to this field called algorithmic fairness, which is maybe you're overly accurate for men and inaccurate for women, and that is not acceptable. And so what, you could, what we could do then is, can you actually boost your conformity score so it becomes better? And again, lots of papers, lots of activities as we speak about this. OK, thanks. Maybe a quick question. But can the okay. quantity y, can that live in a high dimensional space? Yes, 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 yes. I mean, all I need to do is I need to, in the end, I need, I'm going to get a number and yeah. So for example, a way, a way of, 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 of constructing conformity score might be you, you think, oh, well, I'm going to 
estimate the likelihood of y given x. And of course, it might be uncalibrated, yeah. but this will calibrate it. Okay, let's thank Samuel for his talk. Okay.